Baker. Um, I don't know exactly what we're going to do or where we're going to go. You can bring that up here, ma'am. Uh, but we're just going to let God be God. Um, are you glad you came to church? Anybody else? Listen, aren't you glad that, that we can have moments like this, moments of intimacy to where it, it doesn't have to be this scripted thing. It can just be kind of casual. Isn't it good that God is just as much God in the casual as he is in the corporate, in the, in the, in the worship setting? That you can have just as much God in your car as you can have in this church and just as much God in your home as you can have right here? And so today, I, I, I want to grab this and I want to build on it and I want us to keep, continue to grow through this Christmas story and see how God used ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And so grab your Bibles, if you would, and let's go. Uh, we're going to open to Luke chapter number one again, and that's where we're going to take our text. Um, we're going to focus on, on, on what God did in Mary's life, okay? So, but we're going to jump down this time to verse number 46, and that's where we're going to focus uh, from 46 down to probably about verse number 53. But I challenge you to just spend some time in this story later, um, kind of catch up to where we are, and, and, and just let God speak to it. Uh, 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 to your heart as he uses this. Listen, um, Mary was asked to do something that was crazy. Would you agree with that? I mean, can we just be honest? It's like, if you were Mary, how would you have responded to that? God shows up with an angel and says, hey, Virgin Mary, you're going to give birth to a baby. I mean, would you literally be just okay? Or would you be kind of like, really? I mean, God, really? Or is this really God that I'm hearing? God, is that really you speaking or is this my imagination? How many of you have ever had a dream for your life that was so big that you didn't believe it? It was so neat that you didn't think it could happen. And you know, I, we have this way in our lives uh, of getting caught up in life and, and, and getting stuck in routine and stuck in ritual. And those routines and those rituals begin to suck our spirit out, suck our joy out. And the things that we used to dream we would do, the vacation we dreamed we would take, the, the, the ministry we dreamed we would start, we give up on. We think that, well, I, I've got to do this. This is my obligation. Can I tell you this? The, the thing that God puts you on this, world for, uh, on this world for is, is not your career. Now, will God use your career to accomplish what he put you on this world for? Absolutely. But when your career becomes everything you are, you're in trouble. Because your career was not created to be your identity. It was created to be the resource and a tool, a conduit of which God uses the identity of you to bring him into other people's situation. You know what made Mary qualified? She was a virgin. It, it wasn't because she had education. It wasn't because that she was the, 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 the most uh, known person or popular person or famous person. Uh, she just had a standing in her life that made her available. And because she was available, God put his ability in her availability. And if you and I would become available, then we would see ourselves become able because God would put his ability in us too. And so here is Mary that literally was just like every other Jew, just like every other person in Israel. There was nothing that made her special and nothing that made her extraordinary until God showed up in her life. I guess the same could be said about me and you. But in all honesty, we're really, we're not super extraordinary people. I mean, we're kind of common. Matter of fact, there's two things about ourselves that let's, let's realize today. We're ordinary. I mean, we're very limited. Would you agree? Uh, in other words, we can say we're weak. How many of you, some days you feel like the world's going to cave in on you? Ever had that? But how many of you, sometimes you feel like, okay, I can handle this. And then you start handling this, and you realize that you didn't have a handle on it. It had a handle on you, and it starts dragging you around. Next thing you know, you're exhausted, you're emotionally checked out, you're done adulting, and you're ready to hang it up. Anybody else been there? All right, now listen, we, we, I'm not trying to tear you down today. I'm just simply saying the sin has torn us down. I mean, the evil that's in the world, the corruption of in the world, the death, the decay, the, the natural process of, 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 of decaying and falling apart, it, it's taken its toll on us. I mean, you get so many punches in life, and eventually you start getting bruised up and start aching and start hurting. I mean, my body is so sore today, all right? I'm going to tell you two reasons, all right? I told the church, I got old man syndrome. Anybody else got that? The old woman syndrome. I know you're like, I'm not no man, but you're, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, um, did a youth lock-in, realizing now, today, I'm not a youth, all right? Uh, we had a good time. There was 82 people here, 74 teenagers. Um, it was insane. It was awesome. 
Uh, the greatest thing is six of them gave their heart to Christ at the thing. And um, it, it was just, it was an incredible experience. But um, I, I learned this. My body can only handle so much. Anybody else figure that out too? Uh, how many of you sometimes getting out of bed feels like a workout? You know, um, how many of you, you sound like a, uh, one of those little snap books? You know, like Rice Krispies with fresh milk. You know, it's like you're, you're, you're popping, you're crackling. You know, um, I have taken up a hobby. I have a hobby in my life. I, I, I've really gotten into wood turning. Now, that makes you, that's an old man hobby. Um, I, 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 I couldn't sleep there for a while, uh, about last year, about a year ago, and, and I was YouTubing, right? Um, and so I was about one o'clock in the morning going through YouTube, and all of a sudden, a guy had a post, and this is what the post said. A man takes a $5 log and turns it into a $500 base. I'm interested. All right, I'm, that, that, that's a pretty good increase. Uh, I have a savings account at my bank, right? And I think in the past year, I have gained 23 cents in interest. You know, it's like, it's not growing at an enormous rate. So $5 turning into 500, I'm interested. And so this guy takes a wood lathe, right? And he puts a log on it and he takes tools and he begins to shape and mold that thing. And it relaxed me. Like literally I fell asleep watching that video and I became obsessed with wood turning. All right? Um, used to, people say, what do you do for fun? I play basketball. I hike. I go outside. Now I would turn. All right? I mean, so um, yesterday, I, I got home, and, and I was so excited. You know, the teens were on my heart still. I couldn't go to sleep. So I slept for like three hours. Um, and I got up, and I, I would turn. I'm making different things. And um, this is the first year that most of the Christmas gifts that I'm giving personally to people I've handmade, all right? So in there, um, it might look like junk to them, but my back has paid the price. I, I told my wife, I said, I need to find a way to raise my wood lathe a foot in the air. It's on a stand. And you said, why? Because I don't have good eyesight. Anybody else like that? I'm very limited on my vision. And when you're, when you're making like an ink pen, I mean, a millimeter can change everything. Like you can work a solid it takes me about two and a half hours to accomplish two pens. And, 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 and you can work the whole two hours and get all the way down to the finished part. And if for somebody, if for some reason you get startled or some reason you push a little too hard, it breaks and everything you did is done. Or you start sanding and all of a sudden a hole shows up in the wood. And it doesn't matter how much work you've done, it's gone. So when I'm wood lathing, it's, it's kind of like this. I've got my safety goggles on, all right? I'm required by my wife to wear a mask, all right? So I look like I'm in surgery. I got gloves on, you know, I'm sitting there. And I'm literally, if this is my wood lathe, this is my face. I mean, I, I'm like right there and I'm looking at it. I feel like, have you ever seen Bobby McPherson check his text messages, <laughs> all right? He's like, old man in it. All right, I'm sorry, Bobby, if you're watching the video. But uh, he, he's, he always, he gets this little puckered look and he puts his glasses down, and, and he's there. So that's me the whole time. And I, so today, I got out of bed, and I went to stand up, and like a pain shot from my, the back of my knee all the way up to my shoulder, just right up my side. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You ever had that happen? It's the first time that's ever happened to me. And I was like, I don't like getting old. I don't like this. You know, but what I found is um, I have my limits. There's only so much my body can handle. You know what I've also found? There's only so much I can emotionally take. Um, there's only so much spiritually I can take on. And eventually, my emotions get overloaded. And eventually, my spirit gives out. And eventually, I find myself where I used to think I can conquer, feeling very conquered. Anybody else say, me too, I got those limits. All right, you know what that is? I said, you being human, me being human. Us having weakness. I've also found that not only do I have weakness, but I, I, I also have this great ability of messing up. This great ability of saying something stupid. Putting my foot in my mouth. <laughs> he's already testifying. He's like, me too. Then he looks at his wife and he's like, yeah. But what he didn't realize is she was already saying yeah before he looked, right? <laughs> She's like, you do, you do. All right, now listen, hey, um, every one of us, we have that. And it doesn't matter how good of a person you are, you're going to mess up. It doesn't matter how much you love your kids. You're going to let them down at some point. 
Doesn't matter how much you love your husband, you're going to let him down at some point. How much you love your wife, you're going to let him down at some point. And, and therefore, we have to grab it. We're limited. We're, 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 we're spiritually, emotionally, physically, mentally limited. And as we realize that, we need to grab this thought. That means we're usable. See, God doesn't look down and say, I need somebody that's limitless. God looks down and says, I am limitless. God doesn't look down and say, I need somebody powerful. He says, I am that powerful. God doesn't look down and say, I need somebody that has it all together. He says, no, I'll put you back together. And God is simply looking for somebody that has the same mindset as Mary. Read this first verse with me, if you would, verse 46. Mary responded, oh, Lord, my my soul praises the Lord. It praises him. Now, listen, understand this. If God gives you something that's too big, if you've got a dream that's bigger than you can handle, if God's calling you to something that's farther than you could possibly go within your weaknesses and your limits and further than you can possibly go with your goodness and your holiness, if God is doing that, it's going to become overwhelming if you start focusing on the task. It's going to become so exciting if you start focusing on the God that called you to it. And so when Mary's given this task to to birth the Savior of the world, what does she immediately start doing? Praising the God that gave the task. See, how do I take an ordinary life like mine, an ordinary life like yours, how does God take that and make it extraordinary? Well, the very next verse. Look at this. Mary, she starts talking about her spirit. She's like, hey, my spirit. Hey, my, my, my spirit. Not the Holy Spirit. My spirit. My joy, my happiness, my choice is to rejoice in who God is. And so here she describes herself, verse number 48. For he took notice. Would you circle that in your Bible? Or maybe write, hey, God has taken notice of you. Question, have you noticed him? God sees everything that's going on in your life. He knows every circumstance that you're facing. He knows every fear that creeps in your mind. He knows every insecurity that's ever popped up. God notices you. And Mary says, God took notice of what? This lowly servant girl. In other words, this worthless, this average person. But then all of a sudden, she goes from insecure to very confident. And it says, and from now on, all generations will call me what? Blessed. They'll call me blessed. She said, hey, I'm a lowly servant girl. In other words, she sees her weaknesses. She sees her carnality. She sees the fact that she is capable of making great mistakes and messing this up. She notices that she's lowly. She notices that she can't, but then she realizes who she can be because of him. And so today, we're gonna talk about, we've talked about in the past two weeks, what it takes, faith and faithfulness, all right? How God does it through the Holy Spirit. He calls you to come. Then he asks you to take of him. And then he says, keep learning. He says, the Holy Spirit's gonna give you this. And now we're gonna look at who? And that answer is you, you. The lowly, the meek, the mild. See, listen, God doesn't come down and ask for an application. God comes down and gives application. God doesn't come down and say, turn in your resume. God comes in and says, let me turn you in to what I want you to be. And Mary, you're a virgin girl, but you're going to be known. And you're going to be blessed. And Mary goes from, I'm a lowly servant girl, to, hey, they'll know me. Hey, have you heard my name? It's Mary. You better remember it. All right? Uh, I I know it's not a a Christian song and an older video one, but I, I like that little phrase, you must not know about me. Yeah, have you heard it? It's a long, old song. It's about this song where they're about this breakup. And this guy's walking out on this girl. And she says this, you don't know about me. I can have another you in a minute. Matter of fact, he might be here in a minute. <laughs> you know, and I, I'm sitting there, and, and the, the chorus is, to the left, to the left. Everything you own is in a box to the left. <laughs> you know? In other words, I have packed it up, and I have stuck it out there. And you say, I don't like you quoting that. Listen, I'm not saying it's spiritual, but I am simply saying this. Mary, when she walked into this situation, was like, oh, you don't know about me? In just a minute, you will. (laughs) And for the rest of time, you will. Because God's about to do something so real in my life and so great in my life that nobody's going to be able to deny it. That everybody that writes the date from this moment forward is going to write the acknowledgement that Jesus Christ came into my womb. Jesus Christ came into my life. I gave birth. I raised the Son of God for 30 years. I watched that Son of God at 33 and a half years die. He is my Son because my God took an ordinary virgin and made her extraordinary. 
took an ordinary circumstance and made it powerful. And so in there, I look at this and I'm realizing, hey, God wants to do the same with you. So look at what Mary does. All right, and in verse number 49, check out this verse. She starts praising who he is. She says, for the mighty one is holy. Hey, hey, he is great. He's done enormous and tremendous, great, wonderful things. Keep reading with me if you would. Verse number 50, he shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He scattered the proud and haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones. He exalts the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich with empty hands. She's, she had this moment where she recognized herself, lowly servant girl. And then she has this moment where she recognizes who he is. Three things she brings out. Let's look at them. Number one, he's mighty. Meaning this, write it down. God's power has no limits and God's power has no end. In other words, there's nothing that God can't do. I mean, God can do anything. Do you believe that today? All right, if you do, then don't give place to worry. Don't give place to fear. And when they show up, take it captive and kick it out of your life and bring it to obedience. If God can do anything, that means what you think can't be done can still be done even if you don't believe it. All right, now understand this. Uh, God has so much power that all of the universe, it, it responds to his name. Let's, let's read the first four verses of the Bible together, all right? Genesis 1, read them with me if you would. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the deep waters. Pause. Have you ever felt, have you ever felt that nobody saw you, that you were empty, and that your life was one big plague. Have you ever had that moment in your life to where you created such disaster or somebody else created such disaster in you that you felt like nobody would ever love you again? That nobody would ever see you for who you were and nobody would ever see your value? Well, that's how the whole universe was when it met God. And it says this, keep reading with me, right? And the spirit was hovering over the surface of the waters. And then God said, let there be light, and there was light, verse number four. And God saw that the light was good, and then he separated the light from the darkness. I tell people, if you're scared of the dark, that is the best verse in the world, all right? Hey, God still separates darkness from light. You say, well, I am scared of the dark. What do I need to do? Ready? It's deep. Turn on a light. <laughs> I, I never stay in a dark room, all right? I, I, I literally do not know of any time of the week that I am in absolute darkness. When I go to sleep, there's a light on. Outside my kitchen, there's a light on. In my bathroom, there's a light on. In the hallway outside of Lincoln's bedroom, there's a light on. Everywhere I might have to go in the middle of the night, guess what there's in there? A night light. You say, you're 34 years old, grow up. I am grown up and I'm still scared of the dark. Some of the people try to play a prank on me because I've said it and made it very clear. I hate to be in the church at dark alone. And so this past Wednesday night, I went to the bathroom and I came out and they thought it'd be funny to turn out all the lights and run outside. What they don't know is the light still comes through the door from the outside, that the lights outside stay on. You know what I did? I went straight out the door. <laughs> Why? I don't like darkness. Now, let's be real. Anybody else like that? All right. How many of you are the same way spiritually? I don't like to be around evil. I don't like when evil's around me. I hate it when I let it in. I hate it when it consumes my mind. Now, I said this earlier, and I, I'm not trying to embarrass the girl. My favorite thing of the lock-in, and I told him we plan lock-ins by, by how long the games would take. Not the amount of games we play, but how long they take. Yeah, we're going to be with those kids seven, eight, nine hours, okay? And the one thing I know about teenagers, you got to entertain them. you got to keep them going. If they get bored... It gets, it, it gets dangerous. Wade, this past week, by, by the way, Wade is doing an incredible job as our building administrator, is he not? I don't know if you've realized the columns have been rebuilt in the back. They're not holy anymore. Uh, they're, they're worldly. No, I'm just kidding. They, they're, they're, they're solid. The walls got repainted on the side stairs to where every handprint, they respackled and everything. And so within the first five minutes of the lock-in, while we were getting all the kids together, a kid brought in a football, launched it across the auditorium, and hit the wall right there. You see it? It's the one spot. Jim, it's right there near you, all right? Uh, right there in between them. And, and, and I saw it in slow motion flying. And I looked at the kid that was supposed to catch it, and I was like, uh, 
he's he's not going to catch this. Number one, he's in a Tennessee football shirt. Number two, he's sorry. I'm a little bitter. We didn't win the Heisman. I'm bitter. All right. So anyway, it it, it goes flying over his head, and he didn't even stick a hand up. He just <laughs> boom. And I'm like, man, it couldn't have been a clean football or a Nerf football. It had to be some dirty football that gets launched within the first five minutes. That's the only time the wall got hit. The whole night was in the first five minutes. You know why? We were not entertaining them in the first five minutes. You know what we were doing? Getting permission slips, making sure everybody was here. Get, and, uh, actually, let me tell you what I was doing. I expected that there was going to be around 70, but about 15 of those were supposed to be adults. And all of a sudden, kids start walking in saying, hey, I didn't sign up. I don't have permission slip. Anyway, okay. Hey, I brought three friends. Okay. Hey, uh, there's, only, there's only eight adults here. And there's mom and dad's coming through saying, hey, I need to fill out forms. We filled out like 15 permission slips in the first 10 minutes. And I was like, we're in trouble. We are severely outnumbered. This is a small building when you put 74 teenagers in it, especially when they can't use these rooms. And those rooms are designated sleeping areas, which means technically we have to be in this area the whole night. So you know what? The first five minutes of that night for me was, oh God, help me, please. I need, I need some supernatural power. I need some extraordinary power because this guy likes to be in bed at 930. And this guy likes to, likes to be asleep as soon as possible. And this thing's not even starting till 9 o'clock, which technically is when I'm brushing my teeth and getting ready for my bedtime. And now I'm going to spend this. I hadn't done a lock-in in five years that I made it through the whole night because Steve was the youth pastor. And so at 1 o'clock, I'd be like, Steve, see ya. You know, I'm out. Have a good night. But now Steve is, is working another job and not able. Steve came in. And this time at 1 o'clock, Steve looked at me and says, see ya. And I'm like... You reap what you sow, and it does not. It does not feel good. And so I'm in this moment to where it's like, God, you've got to be with us. And so we're trying to plan these, these games by the hour. You know, what's going to consume them for an hour? At midnight, we go in, and I'm, I'm not going to lie. My, uh, we, we always have a service in our youth uh, lock-ins at midnight. And, and, and so I look at the kids, and I give them this this, this encouragement speech, and here's how it went. If you fall asleep during this service, you are done for the rest of the night. You're going to go to the sleep room, and you're going to stay there. That's a good way to get them to Jesus, right? That's my fear. Something happened. We preached like 32 minutes, 33. Service lasted two, and a, two, two hours, 15 minutes, two and a half hours. We got done, and I'm thinking to myself, we're boring them, we're boring them, we're boring them. The whole time we're talking... I have the accuser saying, these kids aren't getting anything. These, these kids, y'all are, y'all are just, y'all are crazy. We get done, she walks up to me, and I can tell, Kay gets this look on her face when she needs to say something. She carries that look a lot, all right? So, no, I'm just kidding. She comes up, and she's lingering. I asked her to sing a song, and she's lingering. I said, sing first. Because I knew. And then I walked over there, and I said, Kay, you want to say something, so let me tag in? Because she and I have this problem. Uh, I can't do something with my hands and talk at the same time. So if I'm texting or typing, and you're talking to me, I'm not hearing a word you're saying, all right? Anybody else like that? And, and so I cannot play the piano and talk, all right? So if I'm playing the piano and I try to talk, you know what happens? I stop playing the piano or I stop talking. Nothing makes sense. I get tongue-tied or finger-tied. It just doesn't work. So I went in and I tagged her in. She said something for like two minutes. And Timmy came up and said something. And what they said was so powerful. And then teenagers kept grabbing that microphone. They kept laying hands on each other and praying. I, I told them, we sat at the piano and made 15 songs up in the key of C. Because they kept going and kept going. I got a text message, uh, um, a messenger, Facebook message last night from a, a parent that they attend a different church, and I love it. I love when churches can come together. You don't have to go to our church to, to go to heaven, by the way. Um, you can have the same God in your church as we have in our church. And, and isn't that a good thing? I mean, we're not better than any church, and no church is better than us. We serve the same God, and we have the same goodness of God in every church that believes in that God, but that's just beside the point. And so she sends me this message saying my kid came home, and the only thing they're talking about, the only thing they're talking about is the service. <laughs> that it was so applicable. That it was everything that they were going through. They said, Mom, I sat there and cried to the whole service. And, and they were like, thank you so much for pouring into these teens. And I'm thinking, 
I thought the thing that they would love the most is that we let them go outside for the first time on a lock-in. And we played hide-and-go-seek in the dark. And, 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 and we did all kinds of flashlight tag and different things like that. I, I thought that would be the highlight. But the service, the service is not. I realize God takes an ordinary moment in an ordinary circumstance and he says if you'll surrender your limitations if you'll surrender your weaknesses i'll give you strength 5 15 rolled around i looked at my watch i was like i cannot believe it's already 5 15 like i thought i'd go home and pass out put my phone on sleep mode on the way home couldn't sleep i thought last night i told my wife when i couldn't sleep and i i, I got up at noon after only laying there about three hours i i told my wife i said i'll probably go to bed really early tonight so i went to bed and i checked in at 10 o'clock i uh, think now i'll go pass out couldn't sleep. 3 a.m., couldn't sleep. My wife came in at about 11.30, uh, crawled in the bed, said, you're not asleep yet? I said, I can't sleep. She goes to sleep so quickly. I told him this morning I, I had to deal with my bitterness because I got so bitter at how fast she fell asleep and, and she's snoring. And I'm like, are you kidding? <laughs> like, I just stayed up all night and all this other. She wakes up an hour later, looks at me and goes, you really should be trying to sleep. Are, what do you think I'm trying to do? I've been laying here for like five hours. You know, I just couldn't sleep. This one girl, after we got done with her service, um, she raised her hand after we were sitting up, putting chairs up. We were going on. We were moving to the next thing. And it, I couldn't get her words off my mind. She said, I lost my mom at 12 years old. She died. She said, now I'll go to school and there's rumors. She said, people say things about me that aren't even true. Things that I didn't even do. And that phrase just kept going through my mind. They're not even true. I asked the kids, I said, how many of you go to her school? And they raised their hand. I said, how many of you have heard the rumors? Every one of them raised their hand. And my heart just out of my chest. Matter of fact, at the end of the lock-in, their caregivers didn't even show up to pick them up. Those two girls stayed with us, and I'm not trying to shame them. We couldn't get them to answer the phone. Finally, eventually, we had to just Take them home. Sissy took them home. And all, I was laying there and I kept hearing her voice. It's not even true. They're saying things that aren't even true. And I heard God saying, hey, that's what the enemy's doing to you too. He's saying things that aren't even true and yet you're letting them sink in. And, and, and she didn't mean it in a bad way. She was actually celebrating and sharing her story. And I was so proud of her and it took great courage. She was like, I'm not even going to talk and here I am. But that kept ringing through my mind and I'm thinking to myself, hey, I wonder if Mary ever had that night where somebody, the accuser, the enemy showed up and started saying, do you really think you're a virgin going to give birth? Do you really think this is the son of God? Hey, even pregnant, do you believe that Mary probably had the night that she sitting there doubting whether or not that this was actually Jesus? This was actually God? Absolutely. Why? Because the accuser loves to lie about who you are and to steal that value. So you know what Mary did? Focused on God's value, not her own. So here it is. When I see myself, I see weakness and, 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 and powerless and sinful, right? But when I see God, what is he? He is mighty, no limits, no ends. And, and, and in three words, God can step into any situation and change it all. God can step into nothing and create light, separating the darkness, pulling the things away from you. And today, at some point, you and I have to have that same testimony as Mary to where we say, let there be whatever it is you said, let it happen, God. Because you're mighty. That's not what else she went on. She said, you're holy. The mighty one is holy. Write this down. This is what holiness means. Uh, incapable of making mistake. Holy means flawless. Not, not able to make a mistake. And, and if that's what holy means, and God is holy, and God is the creator of all things, asterisk, write this down, put it in there. You're not a mistake. That I told him this morning, told him on the video, and I don't know who'll see this video, but in all honesty and reality, you may be the, the one sitting there and, and you're carrying a baby because you were raped or you're carrying a baby because you, you got talked into something or you gave into something and you're sitting there in the world saying, do away with that baby and, and I'm going to tell you, God doesn't make a mistake. Oh, listen, that rape, that person made a mistake. Oh, you gave in. That, you may have made a mistake, but... You know what God does? God takes mistakes and makes something beautiful. Matter of fact, Eric said this to me and it's been really ringing in my head. Mary is a great story of how God can change the world through an unplanned pregnancy. 
how God can walk in into a circumstance and you, you may not be living what you planned for your life and you may not be living in the joy you thought you were gonna have and you, you may not be living in the excitement, but God is powerful, he's mighty, and God is holy. And today, he's not capable of making mistakes, but he is very capable of taking mistakes and making something extraordinary happen through them. And I don't know if it's your marriage, I don't know if you've got rebellious children, I don't know what you're going through in life today, I don't know if financial debt is screaming your name, or maybe you're battling sensory or autism, Maybe you're battling relationship struggles, but I'll tell you this. Don't give up. He's mighty. He's holy. And so today, not only is he holy, but the Bible says, she said he's merciful. Look at that next verse. He says, and, and, and Luke chapter number one, verses 48, 49, hey, the mighty one is holy. Verse 50, he goes on and he says his, his mercy is it's extending to every generation. It's from generation to generation and to everyone who fears him. In other words, to, to everyone who recognizes how powerful and holy he is. That's what the fear is interpreted there. To everyone who realizes just who God is, he has mercy. I used to believe that mercy was God withholding what we deserve. How many of you have heard it that way? That God holds back from us what we deserve. No, 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 no. What mercy means is God refuses to hold against you what you've done. God refuses to hold it over your head. People say, well, God's mercy means that he's not going to pour out his judgment. No, God's mercy means that he's going to throw away the rags of filthiness that you've created. It means that when you have made that mistake or you have fallen flat or you have experienced failure and you've repented and you've changed and you've turned away and the accuser comes back and reminds you and you get broken and you get hurt and you start saying, God, please forgive me. God looks down in mercy and says, what are you talking about? Like, what, what are you talking about? I threw your sins as far as the east is from the west. I do not see this. I see my plans that I have for you. I see the beauty that I have for you. And you may be sitting there and your circumstances may, may be overwhelming. You know why? Because you're limited. And you may be sitting there and saying, I can't take this. This may be the, the Christmas you're spending without the kid, without the loved one. It may be that they died and your heart's breaking. You're saying, how can good come from this? Good can't come from that. But God can bring good into it. God can usher something great in. And today, as you're sitting there and you realize how powerful he is and how holy he is and how merciful he is, that's the first thing you got to see is who God is. The second thing you got to see is who you could be if you let God in. And Mary looks and, and she realizes that this is who God is. And because God is this, well, this is who I will be. So in other words, write it down this way. The Bible says in, in, in 1 John that there's no darkness in him. The Bible says that there's no weakness in him. That his day never has a night. And his kingdom never has an end. That the things he created last forever. You say, well, I don't last forever. Your soul does. You know why your soul lasts forever? Because the breath of God gave you that soul. And, and, and your body may die, but your soul never will. So you better make sure that your soul is going to the place it needs to be. And through Christ, it's heaven and rejecting Christ. Well, you know the story. It's punishment. It's damnation. And God didn't intend that for you. And you look at it and you say, okay, God's mighty, God's, God's holy, God's merciful. Well, what's that mean? Well, if, if God is that way and God says that he's going to put himself in me, then with God in me, guess what? God is mighty, so I can be mighty. Matter of fact, you know this verse, ready? Uh, Philippians 4, verse 13. Ready? Say it with me. For I can do everything, all things, through who? Through Christ who strengthens me. You, you know what happens a lot of times is we love the first word. I can, uh, the first phrase, I can do anything. And a lot of us put our period right there. You can be anything you want to be. How many of you have heard that? Be all that you can be. Can I tell you? Be anything you want to be, but it doesn't mean that what you want to be is going to actually work out. Be all that you can be and understand that at the end of the day, you're not enough. You'll never be enough. Well, I feel like I'm not enough for my husband. I feel like I'm not enough for my kids. You're right. You're not. But in Jesus, you can be. And Jesus, he can give you that power, the same resurrection power that rose him from the dead lives in you. That God has given you authority over all rulers of darkness, all powers of evil. God has given you authority of all sin. And today, get you, in you, in you, because God lives in you, you have might. And so when God comes in, I can do anything. How many of you are doing things today that you never dreamed you would do? 
Anybody married to a person you never dreamed you deserved? There you go. All right, good, good, good. All right, if you're going to acknowledge the other, acknowledge that. She wouldn't look at, hey, 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 hey. Look at him and nod your head yes. Look at him and nod your head yes. All right, earlier when he was pointing out his imperfection, you were, you were all over that, all right? Here he is pointing out his, I got your back, man. All right, here we go. All right? <laughs> I know, she was taking notes. I'm just giving her a hard time. All right, but here's the thing. Listen, hey, hey, God does incredible things. I mean, how many of you, how many of you because of your actions should have forfeited every right that you had to be righteous and holy? And yet God says, nothing's forfeited. Nothing's forgotten. That even before I laid out the foundations of the world, you mattered to me. Even before I said, let there be light in my mind, there was already a you. I told him this morning, there's a song that we sang last week that the last, the last phrase of the chorus keeps ringing in my head. That when he walked out of that grave, he was thinking of me. When he died on that cross, he was thinking of me. Father, forgive him. And then walking out of the grave, hey, now because he lives, you can live. Because he is mighty, I can be mighty. Oh, here's even better. Because he is holy, I can be holy. Isaiah 61, write that passage down. Go, go at it, Cindy. I'll give you a second, just in case he wants to acknowledge his love again. I'm just kidding. All right, Isaiah 61. All right. I'm just kidding. I'm picking on Cindy today. Sorry. He paid me before church. Did you see him? He came in, like, right before the service, and he's like, listen, I need you to hit Cindy today. So, and I'm just kidding. That's not what happened. All right, understand this. Listen, if you're going through oppression and you're going through loneliness, you're going through hurt, go bathe in, uh, in, in Isaiah 61. It's a wonderful passage of who God is in our oppression. And look at what he says. I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord, my God, for he has, here's the first thing he does, dressed me with the clothing of salvation. Number one, here's what God does. Here's what God's holiness brings into your life. It brings confidence, security. In other words, my confidence is in who God has created me to be. I am not known in heaven as an alcoholic, a recovering alcoholic, nor a delivered alcoholic. I'm known in heaven as a child of God. The things that God has recorded in his books, oh, those are not the things that he blotted out with the blood of his son. Those are not those years of abuse and misuse and running from God. No, God doesn't look at me and see my history. God looks at me and sees his son. But he looked at the travail of his soul and was satisfied and then took his satisfaction and his pride of his son and gave it to me, an orphan, gave it to you, an orphan, and now we are sons and daughters. We are holy because he's holy. He gives us confidence. Number two, look at what it says. He drapes me in a robe of righteousness. In other words, not only does God bring salvation, confidence, he brings righteousness. In other words, he makes me all right. He takes what I've messed up and makes it all right. Justification in the Bible means that God makes it as if it never happened in the first place. So in other words, if I were to come in and, and, and go to that door, imagine that it's wooden and imagine that I'm strong. And I went over to that door and I kicked it in. I broke the door frame and it fell to pieces. God would come in, pull the door frame put a new door in, put a new frame in, paint it just like that one. And when you showed up to view me, and when you showed up to see me, you would not see the brokenness of my life, but you would see me as if there was never anything broken in the first place. And that is how people can praise in the middle of adversity. And that is how we can find joy in the middle of conflict. That is how a Paul can say, I am pressed but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned. Why? Because God shows up and he brings his righteousness in. He brings his justification in. And he makes us as if we were never flawed in the first place. And that's why, guys, listen to me. God tells us to love our wife like Christ loves the church, gave himself for it so that she could be presented spotless, without blemish. In other words, my faith, in Christ, may it become her covering. Now, can I bring salvation into her life? Absolutely not, but I can, I can birth salvation so that she can see that Jesus is the way. I can lead to salvation. I can give a chance. May, may, may it be this. May your wife fall so in love with God because how in love with God you are. May your children fall so in love with God because of how in love with God you are. 
Say, I wish they would change. You change. I wish church would change. No, 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 I do too. But you and me are the church, so let's change. You say, how do I change? Good news. Uh, He dresses you. I went into um, Ulta. Is it Ultra? Ulta? It's a store I walk around. I'm like, there's nothing for men here. Nothing. Body scrubs. Nope. I scrub my body with soap. Anybody else like that? I don't need some exfoliating rag. I don't even know what that does. It just sounds weird. Now, bath bombs, I do like those, but I'm just, you know, just going to put that out there. Walking around, um, Jordan had a Christmas party at her work, and they had to get a $15 gift for their, their co-workers that they drew the name of, and so we go to, I can't even say the name, Ultra, the makeup store. We're walking through there, and all of a sudden, I get to the back, and I'm like, like, there's this girl sitting there, just sitting there, and this other girl's just painting her. And I'm like, what in the world is happening? She's like, oh, yeah, they'll give you a makeover. Like, a makeover. Like, what is that? Like, you really like when somebody else is brushing your face? Like, I- I'm sorry. I- I- this is my man mentality. If you start petting my face, you're going to get slapped. All right? That is it. I just get out of my bubble. And that girl was just sitting there, and this person's going around. There's, like, powder going everywhere. It's like some fireworks show of, of and Jordan's like, that, that's, she's explaining it to me. That's, like, pre-foundation. What? When we build a building, we didn't put down a pre-foundation. We just put a foundation. I mean, what, is, what does that mean? Well, you, you put this in the cracks. I'm like, what? And the, in that moment, I had a merry moment where I'm like, thank you for making me a man. Am I right, guys? Anyway, she's like, you can come in here, you can get a haircut. You can, you can get all these things. She said, you may not understand it, but you feel beautiful when you leave. <laughs> when I was reading that verse the other day, ultra came back into my mind, ultra, whatever. <laughs> it's like you walk into God's presence and you leave beautiful. Amen. He's like, okay, listen, give me that rag. I'll give you my righteousness. Give me that brokenness. I'll give you my healing. I'll put a pre-foundation down. And then I'll give you the Holy Spirit. I'll I'll give you some sealer. I'll make it to where your mascara doesn't run. Right? To where you can run and you won't get weary. You can walk and you will not faint. No, you'll mount up on wings of eagles and you will soar. Hey, listen, hey, we need some people that say, okay, God, you will be my confidence. I'm saved, and I'm confident that I am a child of God. And so, therefore, when the enemy comes in like that little girl, what they're saying is not true. So I refuse to accept it because I'm going to accept his holiness. That's confidence. I'm going to accept his holiness. That's righteousness. Number three, the third thing that holiness brings in, it's in there. I am like a bridegroom in the wedding suit or a bride with her jewels. You know what that is? Purity, value. Now the world says when you lose your virginity, you can never get it back. But I believe my Bible says that anything that's in Christ can become a new creation. That old things can pass away and behold, all things become new. So I'm a believer today that if you make the choice and give your virginity to God, then God can restore it as if it's never even been there. You say, well, I just don't agree with that. Hey, get out of your little snooty cloud. And realize that just because their mistake doesn't match your mistake, it doesn't make you any better or any less. And God can take any mistake you've made or any mistake that's been made to you, and God can say, hey, let me make it pure again. I can make it holy again. And I don't know about you, but my worth today, I feel like I'm on top of the world when I put it in his hands. I feel like I'm worthless when I put it in mine. I'm going to be honest with you today. (laughs) On my way here, as all those messages started coming in about how bad it is, I started having to go through this war. Of this, Is my confidence going to be based on attendance today? And then it, it just hit me, you're already here. I looked at our praise team, I was like, we're here. So we're having church, even if we cancel for everybody else, we're still going to have church. Now, I was shocked because that first service, they flocked in. I'm shocked. I I didn't expect more than maybe 15 people in this one. 
I look at that, and I'm like, you know what? I, I think Steve and DJ, or we were just talking, maybe in our Hope Praise team, and said the one thing that we know about today is that this will be the purest service we've ever had because every person that's here wants to be. Now, we're not saying anything about the people that aren't. You don't know their situation where they're driving. Their, their tires may be bald, and it may be they need their car to go to work, and, and, and they, can't, they can't afford to put their in danger. They can't get off of their driveway. And so don't you dare judge. They may be sick. Don't you dare, but I'm going to say this. Every person that walked through that door meant to be here. Can you say that about every service you've ever been to? Absolutely not. You know what happens when everybody that's in there wants to be there? Pure. Pureness happens. And I'm going to tell you now, the Holy Spirit wants to be in here. God wants to be in here. He wants to be in my mind, in my heart, in my life. And therefore, when God comes in, he gives a purity to my heart, a purity to my mind. David said, he renews me. And so God ushers in, and because he's holy, oh, when I see his holiness, I reflect it. I can be holy. You say, I'm so messed up. Hey, you, you're in the wrong identity. Brother, sister, change your mind. Change your focus because you're in the wrong identity. I, look, I looked at that girl and I, I, at the end of the time, I said, are you okay? I'm so proud of you. I, I mean, even her name, and I, I normally wouldn't do this. Her name's Destiny. Just a word of what that means, Destiny. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, man, what, what's coming out of this? Beautiful girl. I mean, I saw our guys. Best lock in for a single boy. I mean, the girls outnumbered them probably five to one. I saw our guys looking at all of them. You know, you ever notice how boys are when they get around girls that they're trying to impress? Girls, bro, y'all can testify to this. They get a little stupid, don't they? Yeah. You know what they think they're doing? Being impressive. You know why? Because the one, number one thing a boy wants to do is see my muscles. Why do you think Alan wears such tight clothes? <laughs> you know why I believe Alan wears such tight clothes? Because he can't get out of them once he gets into them. <laughs> he gets stuck. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know why I wear tight clothes? Because I can't afford the ones that actually fit. <laughs> you say, your shirt doesn't fit. It did it one time. It did it one time, I promise. All right? Now, here's the thing. Understand this. Listen. I look at that girl, and I... Never once did I ask her what the rumor was, because I don't care. Mm, I don't even want it coming out of her lips. Don't even speak it. Don't even, don't let Satan devalue you. You say, well, shouldn't you know? No, 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 no. It's not about what I think I need to know. It's really about what she needs to know. And what she needs to know is you are beautiful inside and out. What she needs to know is God has a value for her. What she needs to know is that God has a plan for her. And what she needs to know is she is loved. And so you know what happened? Here's my mind. I, this, this is why I can't sleep at night. I get so excited because what I think is all those people who heard those rumors are now warriors in her clone. People who didn't know what to think about her at that moment had to make a decision. Are they going to be there for her or are they going to be against her? You know what I love is in the moment when God deserves and we deserve and God has a right to judge and to punish in that moment. God does not show up and feed the rumor. God does not show up and build on the lie. God shows up and becomes a warrior in their corner. And he says, because I'm this, you can be this. So holiness gives me my confidence. Holiness gives me my righteousness. It gives me a, a, a cleaning and then it gives me purity, value. Oh, nothing more valuable than the jewels of God. And by the way, when it comes to his jewelry box, he says, you're his prize possession. You're the great. I like how they say it in the Old Testament. You are a trophy in the hand of God. The other night, um, Allie came over to give my son a haircut. I remember I told you all about Allie uh, last week, and uh, it took three hours, but Allie came over on her own. She brought her son. Um, her son walked in the door. First thing I said is, has your mom told you what it's like to give Lincoln a haircut? <laughs> Silas, his name, Silas, cool name, by the way. Check it out in the Bible. Looks up at me and goes, yep, <laughs> she told me. I said, are you ready for this? He said, yep. He said, my mom once introduced, introduced me to a kid that has autism, and now he's like my best friend, so I figured maybe, maybe I'm going to find a best friend tonight. And I just wait for the haircut, buddy. <laughs> you know, It's the sweetest thing. Um, Lincoln would start melting down. And, and listen, I, I can't even explain to you. Like he, he gets borderline passing out. It is bad. And every time Silas would run up to him with a, a toy or go sit in front of him and laugh, it didn't work. 
but he never stopped. For three and a half hours, he never stopped. Silas is really into football. Clemson fan, told him I'd forgive him. But he, he, he's really into football. He knows, he knows everything. Like I'd bring up a name and he knows where they played in college and now where they're playing in the NFL or if they're not in the NFL anymore, oh, well, he's now just a doctor. Just a doctor, okay. Hey, but he knows. And so my mother-in-law about three years ago got me an autographed uh, Mark Ingram football. Um, Mark Ingram won the Heisman, you know, big Alabama fan. And so it means a lot to me because I know she sacrificed to get it. And I said, let, let me show you my football. I take him down there and I show him Mark Ingram. And he was like, here's what he said. He's like, Mark Ingram is good, but stupid. And I was like, why? He said, look at where he played. I was like, You're, get, out of my, get out of my house. Little eight-year-old talking smack. <laughs> we went back upstairs, and I was like, do you play any sports? Yeah, I play cornerback. I said, I, I, he said, I play both sides of the ball, and apparently he's a really good athlete. So you know what happens when you're an old man and you're around a kid that plays sports? What do you do? You start talking about when you played. All right? How many of you have done it? How many of you women have done it? You say, well, I didn't play sports. What about cooking? What about that casserole that you made that was out of the world? Let's not talk about the hundred you burnt, right? So I, I say, you know, I played on the state, state championship basketball team, right? And he's like, oh, that's cool. And I was like, I'll be right back. I ran into my bedroom. I got my state championship basketball ring because nobody cares to look at it. Nobody. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't even know. It just sits in a shelf that nobody even cares about. My wife doesn't. Even, she's like, that's just too big. It's like, <laughs> I earned this. <laughs> it's like vehicles. The bigger, the better. Right? If you gave me a tank, I would drive it proudly all the way down Interstate 40 with a top down. <laughs> Sticking my head out of it like Santa and a PT cruiser. You know, just, I'm, I'm coming in. I'm gonna, the bigger, the better, right? So when we ordered our rings, I didn't order it like my wedding ring. That sounds pretty bad. Probably should turn the video up. I'm as proud as my I'm, I'm proud of my wife. But if I were to compare this ring to that ring, when we ordered those, it's like this. Like literally, when I wear it, my hand's like this. It's like, are you trying to be Spock? No, I just can't put my fingers together, you know? So I don't wear it. It falls off. I ran and I grabbed it and I gave it to him. Why? It means something to me. And when someone has an interest in what I'm interested in, I show it off. Now, listen, that's borderline sinful because it's braggadocious. I get it. Here's the point. When I read that verse about how God views me as a trophy in his hand, as his most prized possession, as his masterpiece, I just imagine that when the accuser goes to accuse the brethren before the father, which happens all the time, that God says, give me just a second, runs into his arsenal, brings, brings us out and says, check this out. I love this dude. In other words, if you don't believe it, what about Noah? Oh, the whole world hates you. What about Job? Well, he has a hedge around him. I'm going to do whatever you want to him. Job's my boy. Job, we got this. You know why? Because Job knew who God was, saw his might, saw his power. Did Job doubt it during the battle? Yes. But did he sin? No. He still acknowledged who God was. And you know what happened? God brought his holiness in, brought his mightiness in. He brought his restoration and his pureness in. And Job came out richer and better at the end of the story than the story began. And I'm going to tell you this now. When the accuser shows up to tell God how bad you are, God shows up with his masterpiece to show his plan, his purpose, his value of who you are. And today, when the accuser shows up into your life, what would happen if God was your most valuable possession? And instead of running in and showing the accuser your fear and in showing him the weakness, you ran into the heart, pulled out your God treasure, and you said, okay, you want to accuse? Well, I got God. Check out this. He matters to me. The Bible says that in the name of Jesus, that dude flees. He gets scared. He leaves, which brings us to the next thing. He's mighty, so I can be mighty. He's holy, I can be holy. He's merciful, so I should be merciful too. I should be gracious too. That if I'm showing people my prized possession and my prized possession is God, then you know what they should be getting when they see that? The love of God. The, the confidence of God. 
They shouldn't be getting, you're ruling them out and you're giving up. Look, I'm, I'm telling you now, if Satan's telling you to tap out, please don't. And if Satan's telling you to give up on someone, please don't. What would happen if we didn't see prisoners as prisoners, but saw them as people of purpose? What would happen if we didn't look at our youth? And listen, I get this a lot where the older generation looks down on the younger generation because they feel like the younger generation's messed up, but they don't realize that at one point they were the younger generation and just because their problems were different and the rebellion was different, they're not no, any better. Hey, listen, we've heard about the 60s. We didn't live them, but we heard about them. Am I right? How many of you were the 60s hippie kind of person? Back when Bill had hair? All right, you know what I mean? How many of you know what it's like? How many of you remember how, how messed up the 60s were? And you say, well, they do all these godless things. Godless things have been done from generation to generation. But somehow Satan tries to convince us that our evil is not as bad as somebody else's evil. And therefore, we turn our mercy off. But if I know that God's merciful, then I should be merciful too. In other words, the Bible says that I reap what I sow. My question is, is God reaping through you what he sowed into you? Is God getting a harvest of love? A harvest of power. A harvest of forgiveness. See, the same message that was given to Mary is you will give birth to the Savior to the entire world is the same message that God has given to us, that you will take the Savior to the entire world. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And today, my question is this. Are we in that response of, okay, I will. So be it. Let there be. Let this be true in me. And so I want you to understand today that God wants to use you in a mighty way no matter who you are. And the more humble you are, the better you can be used. The more broken you are, the better the story of recovery. The more broke you are, the better the story of provision. And God wants to use you in an incredible way. But the only way that that's going to happen is for you to see him for who he is and for you to realize who you can be because of who he is. And today, today, we can be great because he is great. We can be clean because he is clean. We can be kind because he is kind. And it goes back to what we said in song service. The most foul, powerful present you can give at Christmas is presence, being available. And that is exactly what God gave to you. So how available are you to others? Bow your heads, close your eyes. Let's get out. You know what? I'm excited. I love being here on Sundays. I'm normally here all day. But after this service, we're closing our campus and sending everybody home. So it's like, okay, God, I get to go spend time with my wife. So in there, normally I'd be like all bummed out, but uh, there's a blessing in this disguise. You know, I, I look at that and I'm like, well, this was my plan, but you know what? I kind of like your plan better. My plan was to be here all day, have life groups tonight and see God's power but you know what? God's powerful is just as real in my relationship with my wife as it is in my relationship with you. God's presence is still as powerful in my home as it is in this church. And so I want you to understand and I want you to know that if you don't feel God's presence and all you're feeling is that overwhelming, then maybe you're not seeing God for who he is. And maybe you're not seeing who you can be because of who he is. And so at some point, you got to surrender and say, okay, God, yes, I will. Yes, I will. If you say, be the virgin that carries a baby, I'll be the virgin that carries a baby. If you're the one that says, take the gospel to the other side of the world, okay, God, I'm going to the other side of the world. If you're the one that says, hey, I want you to give a little bit extra. I want you to, to go a little bit further. I want you to work a little bit harder. I want you to sacrifice a little bit more than, okay, God, yes, I will, because you're the God of let there be. You're the God of the I am. You're the God of every moment, the God of everything. You're, you're the God that has no limits. And so therefore, God, I will not limit you and I will not hold you back and if you say hey 20 years ago you told me to marry that woman 18 years ago you told me to marry that man then God I don't care what is going on around me yes I will I will I will I will trust you I will believe and because of that God you are mighty you are holy you are merciful and because you are I will be too and so today I'm gonna have Glenn to just play I'm gonna have you take a moment and surrender it and say, yes, I will. You know what the I will is. I asked you at the beginning, how many of you have ever had a dream so big that you didn't think it was possible? Maybe it's time to go back to that dream and say, okay, God, yes. Let it be done. Let it be said. So will you take a moment right there where you are?
and worship. When God calls you to something that scares you to death, worship. Because it's that God that called you that's going to get you through. It's that God that chose you that has laid out the plan. So worship. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. And I see many searching for answers. Far and wide that I know. We're all searching for answers. team do a great job this morning. Casey, Yolanda, thank you so much for what you do. Listen, hey, let's go out. Let's go out and celebrate who we are in Christ. Be safe. We love you. Hey, sign up. Grace Family, all one word. Text it to 97000. That'll get you weather updates. If we have to cancel for any reason, go to Facebook or anything. Tomorrow night, we are planning to have youth, but we may have to make an adjustment to that. So you'll want to be signed up for that. God bless you. Hey, let's celebrate who Christ is. Let's look forward to being back together again later. Hey, pray for our kids next week as God uses them in a mighty way. Shake hands, love on each other. Be safe going home. You're dismissed.